Uh, hi there, folks. Um, this is WP Tonic, uh, episode 101. Yes, we've um, during the week we had our milestone, our hundredth episode. We've had some technical problems, folks, but in the true spirit of WordPress, um, me and my great panel have overcome the hurdles, and we're recording this show on Google Hangout because Blab. <laughs> Um, this morning imploded, but it should be a good show. We're going to talk. We've got some good quest, um, topics, and then we're going to go on to our main topic, which is going to be around e-commerce, not solely about WooCommerce, but the general subject and a bit of WooCommerce. So first of all, um, I'm going to um, let my um, great panel introduce themselves. Sally, would you like to introduce yourself first? Oh, I suppose I could be persuaded. <laughs> My name is Sally Getch, uh, rhymes with sketch. Um, and my business is WP Fangirl, and I am the organizer of the East Bay WordPress meetup in Oakland, California, which is not to be confused with Oak Lee, California, which is where I live. That could be confusing, but that's life, isn't it, Sally? All right, David, would you like to um, introduce yourself? Yeah, my name is David Laetta, rhymes with pancetta. Uh, I like that. Um, <laughs> That's, the new, That's the new one. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm out of Orlando, so it's a little bit later in the day for me out here. <laughs> yes, and you're going off, you're going into the forests, aren't you, for the next am, few yes. weeks, aren't yeah, you? Actually, I'm going to be out in California for the next two weeks, but uh, off the grid. <laughs> How are you going to cope, David? I can cope with that. Uh, I'm sure I'll have plenty. Being in California or being off the grid? Being off the grid. Well, it's going to be quite enjoyable, but I'm sure I'll be on the internet plenty still. <laughs> oh, all right then. And I'd like to, um, John, my beloved co-host, like to introduce yourself. Sure thing. My name is John Locke, and my business is Lockdown Design. There well, you go. That was nice and simple, wasn't it? Yeah. So... Um, I posted everybody some stories that I found that I thought that we could start off. And um, the number one story um, was um, the release of Gravity Forms 2. Um, let's start off with Sally. Um, what did you think of the upgrade? It looks pretty good. It does look pretty good. They haven't actually, uh, if you read the article, you'll see that you know it's available for, for new installs, but if you've already got Gravity Forms installed, they haven't rolled out mm. the automatic uh, update yet. So I have not uh, experienced it in, in practice. Um, it seems like it will be useful, and you know I, I will want to double check and, and make sure that it's not going to break anything uh, at the time that I have to you know update it on a few dozen websites. Um, but I I use Gravity Forms all the time, and so I, it's you know always nice to see uh, continuing work there. Yeah. So what did you think, David? Yeah, I haven't um, I haven't played with it yet, as uh, Sally said. You know, those of us who already have it installed on our sites are probably just going to wait for the update next week. Um, but that is a really, really extensive uh, set of release notes. They, I mean, I mean, of course, it's it's a large version. You know, a uh, a point oh coming out, but there's just so much to go through. Um, I'm I'm most interested in uh, the conditional logic uh, changes, just because yeah. there have been a few times I've wanted to use some of the fields that weren't available for conditional logic. Uh, in my forms, so I'm looking forward to that. And it looks like I'm going to have to learn a whole lot of new uh, filters now. <laughs> yeah, but it does look like you know the the additional fields. That's going to be a, a a real bonus, isn't it, Dave? You know, you'll be do, you'll be able to do a lot more than you than even you could do. Absolutely. So, like, um, for instance, I wanted to be able to verify whether um, whether certain selections were made in a multi-select field, and in the past you weren't able to do that, not not out of the box, but now that's going to be apparently one of the new ones. Yeah, and of course the catcher, um, they've got the new one, that's the kind of main public one, but the conditional logic is... Yeah, the, the conditionals are, are way more interesting to, to me. I think <laughs> captcha is an instrument of the devil. <laughs> well, I think the new... The, um, 
version two is a bit better, but there we go. But I do agree with you. What about you, no, John? No, anybody's what? capture anywhere. All right, there we go. That, 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 that. Lord has spoken. Uh, Robert, what do you think, John? No, I think, um, I mean, obviously this is like a major release. Uh, I haven't had a chance to test it before it gets released to the general public like next week, but it looks like the conditional logic is uh, greatly improved. Um, and also there's uh, some enhancements with the responsive uh, qualities with the form, so that's going to you know, be able to better support mobile devices, and I think that's going to make things like a lot easier because sometimes styling gravity forms is, is a little bit tricky, so uh, it'll be interesting to see how that does. I'm going to have to test this out on a lot of sites, so yeah. Yeah, and it's already um, you know pretty interesting and easy, easy-ish to build like a whole business workflow just around gravity forms, and any enhancements make it you know even easier that I can basically have that power almost all of the uh, functionality of a site, yeah, all the so logic. I, you know, I just tend to, because I've got the developer's license, so if I am working on anything, I just tend to use it, but um, David, have you used any, how do you think it compares with some of the other competitors in the market? Do you think this um, upgrade kind of puts it up in the top tier again, or do you, have you been looking at some of the other solutions, or you just stay with this? Um, I stay with Gravity Forms. I uh, haven't really considered switching to any other form solution, and at the cost, it's really worth it. Um, I can see a basic site you know, that I can say, just use the contact form feature that Chetpack has, or, you know, maybe even use contact form 7, but I haven't used contact form 7 in years, and every time I have to go mess with it, I hate it, and it's, I mean, it works really well, and it's great that it's free, but there are too many people who are just going, oh, no, that one's free, and that one costs 40 bucks to put on my site, so, I mean, I gotta save 40 bucks now and spend an extra 20 hours setting it up. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, it's, it, it is. I, I mean, you know, I hear really good things about Caldera Forms, about Ninja Forms, about uh, Captain Forms. You know, it, 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 I'd love us to have at our at our meetup like a, you know, a form face-off. But the thing is that to, to test all of the additional features that go, go with those plugins, I'd have to shell out a heck of a lot of money. Um, and Gravity Forms, you know, their developer package is a, is a much better deal than, than having to buy all of the extensions yeah. for something like Ninja Forms. Uh, if you, I have used the free Ninja Forms when I wanted just a simple uh, contact form, and it and it's great. But once you start needing people to be able to upload a file or or whatever, it's just easier to to put Gravity Forms on there. Yeah, totally agree. So I think we covered that one, um, but um, it looks, you know, I thought we'd need to talk about it because it's such a kind of um, big plug-in and um, a lot of the WordPress developer um, community use it, so I thought it's worth talking about. So on to, um, on to the next news story that I thought was, um, it's a subject that we've touched before, but Brad from um, Delicious Brains, um, uh, wrote this blog post and it was in the in the tavern, so I thought it was worth covering again. So let's start with Sally again. What did you think of this this um, post and this story? This is one of those things where you know, in an ideal world, uh, I agree with you. Um, and in certain cases, I mean, how it tends to break down is if there's something where you know you have a developer license and uh, that I use a lot that I have a developer license for. I'm usually going to use my license, you know, uh, and with things like Gravity Forms, you know, it, it will be a fairly astonishing occurrence if I don't renew that license. Um, with things where there's only a, a one-off license available, I generally have the client buy the license, and I prefer to have them do it, but let me tell you, it is darn difficult not to get them to pay for the license to get them to actually go in and buy the license and send the information so that they're the one that gets the bill um, and uh, and so on and and even when you know I have had an instance recently with the events calendar pro where you know I spent about four months 
reminding the client that she needed to upgrade this and and double checking and saying, well, no, I don't have your, you know, I, I don't have your credit card. I have her login. I don't have your credit card information. I mean, it's amazing how many people will give me their credit card information. Uh, but, um, I, you know, so I, I, I can't renew. The, you have to do this yourself. And we finally got it done. And, and you know, I still had to go in and, and update the um, license key and, and, and so on. But, you know, even when a client is, is, is willing, uh, there are a lot of people for whom that actually seems to be technically very, very difficult. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree with you. What do you feel, David? Yeah, the impetus should be um, on you as the, as the maintainer of the project, um, you know, to make sure everything comes together for your client. But there are certain times that they will need to uh, shell out and it, it's not it's not a money thing but I agree it's a making sure they are the ones that are on the hook for you know years down the road and uh, I honestly don't see how difficult it would be to tell somebody um, I say I don't see it and yet I actually see it actually happen with clients just to say listen you're already paying me money cool now you need to go pay <coughs> these money, people money too um, you know you know how to buy things on the internet I, I trust that <laughs> um, but yeah, there seems to be that cognitive leap, and I do wish there were a better way to kind of pass billing along to the clients. Um, but I have not seen I have not seen any company uh, do that well. Um, WP Engine just started doing a um, uh, a staging service uh, that looks promising. Basically, a way to stage client sites on WP Engine for free. And then uh, when you're ready to pass it on to the client, you kind of send it over to them and uh, go, you know, great. If you want other people on the Internet to see this, now you have to go pay WP Engine. Um, <laughs> it'd be really nice to see plugins be able to do that. I'll give a full, I'll give a full marks for originality. Um, sorry. <laughs> um, but, yeah, what do you feel, John? Yeah, I just want to say, David, like, thumbs up. I like that idea with uh, WP Engine. Uh, you know, having to where you can stage the site and then hand the bill to the client. Uh, Flywheel has been doing that for a little while, so, you know, it's good to see them, uh, you know, pick up on that. Uh, so with the licenses with the clients, there's kind of like three ways you can go. You can either, you know, ideally, like, have the conversation at the beginning of the project, like, hey, here's how much you're going to need to budget, you know, based on our discovery session, like, here's what you're going to need to budget for plugins. Each year, you're going to have to... Uh, you know, spend this much on licenses, and that's ideally. And and some clients are pretty good about that, and they maintain their own. Um, and then the other ways you can go is uh, you can have them piggyback off your developer licenses, um, or you can uh, just you know buy the licenses, uh, you know, individual licenses, and then say in the contract like, hey, after you know this expires, you're responsible for upgrading. Um, ideally, like, you always have people in charge of their own licenses because if you have them piggyback off your developer license, now it's on you to keep up that developer's license for any, like, projects that are out there. And if you don't, um, then you're, it's your fault, like, if the site breaks. Um, and then if you, you know, just install, buy, like, a single license and then don't have that conversation with them, like, hey, like, you need to, like, uh, update this, like, each year, they won't, and eventually the site will either, you know, break or n not be compatible or get hacked. So I, in a perfect world, we're always, you know, having that conversation, like, at the beginning like after we, you know, kind of make a plan for like what the site is and say like, hey, part of this budget each year you have to put toward maintaining your plugins and you own the licenses. I think that's the best way to go. So. Yeah, I think that was great you put. Um, I'm just going to put my um, 10 penniths in. Um, I understand where Brian was coming from this, uh, from this post and there's no right and wrong. I don't really agree w with his position on this. Um, I think it's much more complicated myself. Um, how I do, obviously I've got a maintenance company, but I've got some leg quite a few legacy clients, and if it's a plug-in that I'm, that I'm going to use a lot, 
on clients' websites. Um, they normally come in with my developer's license, but they they've made they're made totally aware that for that license to be maintained, they've got to have an ongoing maintenance contract with WP Tonic. These are legacy clients when I was um, running an agency in Reno, and they've come in and they always were on some form of maintenance plan. Um, and um, I think I'm doing a job for a client now, um, and they wanted member press and they wanted all the functionality so they, they bought the they bought the developers license because I don't plan to use member press that regularly so I, so it was best that the client bought, bought the license and that's what they've done um, I think when it comes to themes I, I definitely think the client should buy the theme um, and I, themes uh, don't really bother me as much because the themes get updated much less often than uh, uh, than plugins do. I think it's a perception and expectation problem. Uh, I know Syed Balki posted uh, a similar post uh, to, I think it was to Optin Monster, maybe it was to Awesome Motive site, I don't know, one of one of his sites uh, a few months ago uh, about Optin Monster saying that, you know, clients should be purchasing their own license for the plugins they're going to use. Uh, he came about it from a financial sense, um, you know, saying that it makes more sense for you to uh, to have your clients pay for it, and it, of course, makes more sense for them to have only one person using an unlimited license than an unlimited number of people. Uh, but, there, but there's that client expectation of um, client works with me. They are using my Gravity Forms developer license, which is fine because I can use it on unlimited sites, so it's not really bothering anybody. And then they don't work with me anymore for whatever number of reasons, and they come back a year or two later, and uh, something's going on with their site, they need to contact Gravity Form support, and they are unable to because they don't have the uh, login to do so. Most of these you're paying for, you know, most big plugins you're paying for support. And their expectation is, well, I'm already using this on my site. I already paid for my site. I deserve access to this. Uh, or the perception of um, the ability to reuse that wherever they want. So... Say, for example, you, most of these, when you place your license key into the site, into an option on the site, your license key is visible on the site. So they have that ability to go and use that on whatever other sites they want if they you know, realize that that's the case. Um, you'll, you'll end up being on the hook, potentially, for more work that, you know, than you've been paid for. Yeah, I think it's also the, how the license, you know, um, most of the plugins that I have bought have got a pretty a more sophisticated um, you can deactivate them even if you don't have access to the fin um, to the back end of the website anymore but I think it's just um, if it if you if you speak to the client you're upfront about it you explain it and also it's in the contract um, and it's in black and white and it's clearly understandable um, and everybody agreed to the situation. I, I, I think it's a very grey area. Um, but I, I do agree with Brad. If um, in the totality of it, it would be better. And that's what I do push. If it's any, if it's obvious, I'm not going to have a, a long-term commitment with that client. And they. Uh, if I can, it's better that they buy everything and it's all in their name. But it doesn't always pan out. So I think it's a much more grey area. So I think we've covered that because it can just go into a loop, can't it? Because it's one of these real grey things. So um, on to the next story that I thought was um, reasonably interesting um, was the Google um, fonts. They have... Um, upgraded their interface and how the system works. Um, I thought that was pretty interesting. Would you like to start off with that, um, actually, um, John? Because you also um, said um, it kind of triggered something that you said last week about how Google Fonts have really kind of influenced web design in general. So would you like to start off with that, John? 
Yeah, sure thing. So um, Google Fonts, uh, a lot of people, you know, already use this as it's basically like a free font uh, repository. Uh, there's certain fonts in here uh, that you know a lot of people use in their web design, and basically their user interface changed to where you can preview um, the fonts like much more easily and and see like the different types. Uh, you can see them like used and in different uh, various uh, you know font weights and uh, and and font sizes and and uh, so a lot of people and I think probably that they were influenced a little bit by like other services like this like Typekit um, that that allow you like more of a preview um, of the font but a, a lot of people are like yeah this is cool you know. Um, I, I can see the fonts that I'm selecting like a little bit more easily, like stacked side by side. Um, so, yeah. yeah. Before I ask the other two, um, Sally and David, for their comments, um, I, I was thinking what you said last week about this. Um, and do you think, do you think some Google and because they're free and do you? Because we were we were doing that review of that site, and you mentioned that it had a lot of different fonts, and you said that they're probably trying to match up with this Google free font. Do you think, in some ways, it's also had a def deferential effect, um, their influence on fonts, or do you think it's been beneficial? Sorry. I think, uh, well, yes. Oh, are you asking on. all of us or John? <laughs> no, I was asking John, and then uh, I was asking John. Oh, sorry. okay. So, oh, as far as like detrimental, I mean, um, I wouldn't say it's really detrimental. I mean, it's like one of those like open source things that people just kind of take for granted, kind of like font awesome. I, it's just one of those things that people expect to use, and they're like, hey, here's some cool fonts. Uh, if I can't afford to buy like a premium font. Uh, you know, from either like Typekit or Fonts.com or something like that, then I can just go in Google Fonts and find something that matches like kind of close. Um, but I, I will tell you that like you know, premium design like sites that are like really um, uh, for like a high level project uh, are usually going to use some sort of like premium font. Um, it's not totally necessary, but uh, a lot of designers will just, you know, kind of gravitate toward, you know, using like premium fonts. And Google Fonts is just so, you know, you can you can find fonts that'll work, um, but you know, it's fine. It's you know one more way to you know get a project done. But you know, uh, fonts is just you know one more cost um, that has to be considered. There's you know definitely like a lot of sites that that won't be built uh, with Google Fonts alone. So, um, Go on, Sally, what did you think of it? Well, I, I think that, you know, the site where we were really seeing too many fonts, uh, she had them all in images, so I'm not even sure whether they were Google Fonts. I, I mm -hmm. mean, you know, the, the, the tendency to use too many fonts is a sort of newbie designer mistake and, and has been since there actually started to be fonts on computers. Uh, you know, from from the, it dates back to the early days of, of desktop publishing. Um, so I don't know that that uh, Google Fonts is is really responsible for contributing to that. Um, you know, I think if people are loading a ton of Google Fonts on their sites, there may be some performance issues. There may be you know that 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 tends to add up, but. Uh, that's a different sort of, of problem and I'm trying to decide whether I like the new uh, layout it's sort of like well it's pretty but at the same time it's kind of harder to compare the fonts in detail if they're not all showing the same specimen text true so um, David what did you think uh, well particularly about um, I mean, I, I think the new layout looks nice. Uh, I wish there was a bit easier to pair them. Uh, that's the one thing, that's the one feature I would like them to have improved. Um, but specifically on the question of how is Google Fonts affecting the font world, uh, you have that expectation of free now. Um, you know, we can get something really great for free. Uh, you have the, the 
misperception that all fonts should be free. So, um, you know, there's, there's the client who's like, no, 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 we need to use Gotham on this. And um, just, you know, it's a font. So just use, do the code and make the Gotham appear. That, that'll work, right? Um, and then something that we don't really consider too often is how much we are uh, giving to Google uh, in exchange for licensing fonts from them for free uh, by, you know, by using Google fonts and by using them from their content delivery network. They're absolutely, you know, able to keep refining uh, all of their profiles about the, about us, uh, gathering data from the sites that are using uh, those fonts. Uh, whether you consider that a good or a bad thing, I'm just saying that you know we are not getting these at zero cost. Yeah, I think you. Um, there they were some. There were great points, David, and there were some of the issues that I was um, more thinking about actually. And um, I don't want to go into because we could spend a whole show talking about maybe Google has too much influence on books, fonts. And also images and the whole thing, but I think they were great points, David. Um, so I think we go on to the. I think we had a, we've had a, some good stories there. I think they were uh, did my best. Um, so I think we go on to the main main subject, folks. But before that, we go for our break, and we will be back in a few seconds. Uh, we're coming back um, from our break. You probably heard some uh, advertisement from uh, WP Tonic. Um, so we're going to go on to the main subject is um, um, e-commerce and um, the things that you should know about. Um, oh, you know, obviously it's it's a WordPress focused podcast, um, but um, I just want to cover broadly some of the things that um, somebody thinking of starting um, their journey in e-commerce should really understand um, that would help them make some right decisions and maybe talk maybe talk a little bit about WooCommerce. Obviously, um, we've got about half an hour, so it'll quickly go, but I'd like to start off with Sally. Um, you know, I haven't done a. Um, I did a lot of work with Shopify and a bit of work with WooCommerce about 18 months ago. Um, but I know, I know, some of the panel are very actively involved and some not. But to start off with, Sally, what would you start off with? Some maybe two things that you think somebody starting on this journey should really understand. Uh, well, let's see. I think one thing that anybody who's thinking about starting e-commerce, an e-commerce site should understand is that if you are planning to make money from a website, which presumably you are if you're selling stuff, you have to expect to spend money on it. And that's going to be true whether you're using, uh, you know, a WordPress plugin, whether you're using something like Shopify, whether you're using something like, you know, Cafe Press. Um, you know, it, it tends to take money to, to, to make money and uh, there will be uh, costs involved whether you host it yourself or whether you use a uh, hosted service. Uh, and the other thing I think is understanding the trade-offs between the, you know, relatively speedy setup and, and uh, having stuff taken care of you that goes with, with using a hosted service and the ability to customize and control things that goes with uh, hosting it yourself and, and uh, using, you know, maybe a WordPress plugin, maybe something like, you know, Magento, but, you know, something that, that you actually control and install on your own site. Yeah, I get that. Um, David, I, I know, um, I'm just going to ask you this broad question. I don't have any insight or you would want me to pass it on to John. Um, when, when do you, you know, you, I said Shopify, but there's a number of um, popular kind of, um, I'm trying to find the right word to explain it, um, fully hosted, fully managed internal enclosed systems like Shopify. There's a number of them. And then you've got the kind of um, plug-in solution with WordPress and WooCommerce is the most popular. Would you like to pass any comment about it when somebody might want to look at the WordPress instead of one of these fully hosted solutions? 
Yeah, when you're using a uh, hosted solution, and I'm going to use a an extremely relevant example, I think, uh, because this happened to me five minutes before we started the show today, um, trying to purchase uh, some items from a uh, Shopify site this afternoon, and I run Privacy Badger on my browser, and it blocked a couple of uh, ad networks, and the checkout features do not work simply because some ads are blocked on the page. So I'm not viewing Oops. an ad on this website, and I also can't purchase the thing that makes them like 100 times as much money as that one ad impression. Um, but purchasing a gift, so I decide, okay, I'm going to copy this URL, go into an incognito tab where I have literally no extensions running, the page still loads poorly, and the checkout page doesn't, or the, excuse me, uh, after the checkout page loads, uh, after me refreshing it a few times, the order process page never actually loads. Um, and then I get like this blab, blob of text that I can tell is a, your order is complete, but you know, it's unformatted, everything, didn't get an email, so I ended up printing it just to make sure that I had it. Um, but, but my point of me having a poor experience trying to buy something on a Shopify site today, uh, and I've built plenty of Shopify sites for, is that you are dependent upon some of the decisions that they make. They have their Shopify-wide ad network that they decided, you know what, we're not going to allow your store to actually work unless your client is, uh, unless your um, visitor has that activated. And how many people do you think generally might have something blocked or might just not have JavaScript enabled uh, who, who will realize that, you know, non-developers realize, oh, I know, it's because I'm actively blocking something. Um, that same problem could happen in a WordPress site, but on my own site, I have a bit more control, or when I'm building it for a client, I have a bit more control in what I'm doing than saying I'm abiding by all the rules that uh, you know this third party over here has imposed. Yeah, I think I think that was a great insight, Dave. You, 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 you're on the road on this episode, <laughs> uh, David. I'm uh, right. angry. I'm angry at. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I think I think that was a great example, and it kind of showed the benefits of using a host uh, internal, you know, kind of semi-enclosed system like Shopify, and the benefits of using something open source. Um, would you, before I go on to John and um, David, of of these fully hosted enclosed system, do you think, even though you you know you've been frustrated this morning, um, do you think Shopify is one of the better ones? I know, but you just kind of said you got a bit frustrated with this particular website. Or do you think there's better kind of fully hosted solutions? Or do you think the point you were making kind of covers them all really? Well, of the um, of the hosted ones that I've used, Shopify has been my favorite. It has a good yeah. trade off of uh, extreme feature uh, that, you know, you're, I'm going to big commerce, OS commerce, whichever one of them is the managed one, uh, the, the extremely in-depth amount of features you can get with those, uh, it's a good trade-off between those features and um, ease of use. Uh, there are some other ones, like um, what, Hello Merch works pretty well, uh, but that one's a little bit less customizable. Shopify is kind of developer-friendly uh, to, um, you know, to customize. But none of them, in my opinion, are really, really great. And a good example of one reason you might want to choose to host on your own, uh, almost everything on Shopify is a plugin, which we from the WordPress world are familiar with plugins. In the WordPress world, we're also familiar with the fact that someone says, hey, here is a uh, contact form plugin, or here is a, um, more, rel more to the point, here is a UPS plugin for e-commerce, for WooCommerce. Uh, it's 40 bucks, whatever that is. I pay my 40 bucks, I've got it. Uh, with Shopify, it's, hey, here's your UPS add-on. It is $5 every single month. Yeah. Uh, and that's just for one feature. Now you want yeah. your uh, other feature. You know, Now you want your um, yeah. currency conversion or whatever. That's another $4 every single month. It soon, uh, it soon mounts up, doesn't it? Better, I, when, yeah, I, when I was knocking a few out um, for clients, it soon mounted up. And some of the plugins didn't work that well. Yeah, you can uh, them beforehand, and some are outrageous. I really, for a client who wanted a, um, a uh, featured image slider, you know, just they have a product that has like 10 images associated with it, so they want it to have a little carousel of those images, and uh, I ended up writing something custom just because I couldn't see to tell them, hey, listen, you can use this. It costs you $7 per month. Um, it allows you to use this on up to five products. I just could not see trying to sell that to my client. 
No, no, that wasn't a good deal. What? So, um, John, you know, you do a fair bit with WooCommerce. When do you do you have that conversation if they approach you? Um, or I don't know if you work, will work with Shopify or anything like that, or you just purely stay with a WordPress solution. Do you have that conversation, or mo or most of the people you've kind of use a WordPress solution? Most of the people that um, I've worked with have you know, self-hosted with WordPress. Um, but sometimes, you know, the budget isn't right to do like a self-hosted solution like a WordPress or a Zencart or something like that. And that's when you would want to look at something like a Big Commerce or a Shopify or a Squarespace. Those type of solutions where you're just paying like a monthly fee um, are good if you want to just prove that there's a market for your product and you don't have a lot of budget. That's really when I would recommend things like that. Uh, because as Sally mentioned earlier, any type of self-hosted e-commerce solution, whether it's WooCommerce, uh, whether it's uh, Magento, whether it's Zencart, you're going to have to pay for hosting uh, on a decent setup uh, more than likely you're going to want like a SSL certificate and you're going to want to keep a developer close at hand because all these e-commerce solutions require a continual development. Um, you have more flexibility to customize things exactly the way that you want with a self-hosted solution but again you're going to have to pay for any yearly plugin licenses, your SSL certificate and like any ongoing development, uh, WooCommerce and you know is very extensible, but it changes like every so often, and so you need someone to help you keep it up, or eventually things are going to go haywire. So, uh, an e-commerce site is is more of uh, an undertaking, like a continual undertaking, than a simple straightforward marketing site. Um, and so, if if you're wanting to sell products online expect to have like a larger yearly investment in that site. Yeah, I think uh, I think all the panels so far have made fantastic points because I think it's a bit like the news story about, you know, who should who should own plugins, WordPress plugins. But this is really a very gray area and some people say, "Oh, you should go with Shopify or one of the other hosted solutions or you get another Another group people say you should definitely go with um, WooCommerce and that, but I really you've think a, uh, you've I got think... a good surprise guest who just joined that you can probably ask this question to. Oh, well, who's that then? Uh, do you, I see he's uh, added on, but he's muted. Chris Kristoff. Uh, yeah. Granted, I don't know if Chris has his camera up or anything. I have no idea if I can. Boop, boop, boop. He saw you're talking e-commerce today and uh, sent him the link and. Let's see if he can get you connected. Also, you're muted now, so. You're muted, Jonathan. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he said he's working on getting his camera. <laughs> oh, well. Still, still muted. can't hear you, Jonathan. We're back now. Okay. Yes, yeah, you're back. Oh, uh, um... So, um, like I say, I think you made some fantastic points because I, I've done, I just think it's a really grey area and you really got to do some pre-planning. Um, Sally, um, when I did a few of these, I, there was one, two particular areas that always seemed to come up. Um, one was how shipping was going to be dealt with and um, linked with um, sales tax as well, shipping and sales tax. And the other one was accountancy um, software integration, especially QuickBooks. Oops. Ooh, ooh. Ooh. Um, so can you, can you give me some insights about that? Those are all uh, genuine issues. Um, I work on a WooCommerce site a while ago where they had they were using a, a QuickBooks integration solution that you know needed an API key hooked up and it didn't work with um, Cloudflare which was um, definitely a problem because uh, 
you know, the site had been getting a lot of unwanted uh, bot traffic. Chris, are you on a plane right now or something? Are you with us, Chris? <laughs> yeah, um, I think so. Yeah, we can hear Chris. Thanks for joining us. Uh, yeah, um, uh, you were, have you been able to hear uh, most of the conversation? Yeah, I've been able to hear it. I've uh, not been able to respond to it. <laughs> All right. So um, would, would you like to jump in and um, give some um, responses to some of the things we've been saying? Yeah, so I would I would honestly never recommend Shopify. There's, there's a couple scenarios where it makes a lot of sense um, if you have really small time frame and you just need something up very quickly for a very short time, it makes a lot of sense. But if you're planning to use it as part of an ongoing business operation that you you know, aren't going to be using at one time, uh, there's definitely a lot to be said for both owning the data and being able to directly control it. Because the second you want to do anything that Shopify doesn't allow for, you're going to wish that you were on another platform. Yeah, uh, just to help the... Um, this that was, a, that was an interesting sound, Chris. Um, I just pet tiger. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, just for our viewers, Chris, can you introduce yourself? Or was he gone? Yeah, I'm actually on a bus right now, so uh, heading back. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I'm Chris Kristoff. Uh, I helped make this little thing called Jago Shop way back in the day. It became a thing called e-commerce. Apparently that's a thing now. Uh, and then I worked with Tim Williamson, and uh, we've made this little uh, e-commerce platform called Easy Digital Downloads. Oh right. Uh, uh, so and then I also uh, I also work at Austin awesome Motive, and I am the lead developer on uh, what was Google Analytics for Yoast, uh, but now Monster Insights. Well, thank, thanks thanks for joining us. Um, but um, yeah, I think you've made some really great points, Chris. Like I was saying, uh, the rest of the panel also made some fantastic points. It's just a, re I just, I've, I, I see kind of Shopify as just to try out to see if there's a market and try not to invest enormous amount with Shopify. Just right. Get some... Can you export your products and stuff from Shopify, or, or are you just starting over totally from the beginning if, if you switch? Uh, 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 but... Sorry. You can. You can. Um, it's, it's... I haven't actually done it for a while. It wasn't as easy as they made out. It depended on the circumstance. But like I was saying, Sally, I, I just think as a, as a way of trying something out, um, but then I would I would recommend if you're going to start investing a lot of money that you would be better off on a uh, on a system where you've got a lot more control. So um, they, um, let's go with John. Um, what would um, you? Sorry, sorry I just want to uh, point out that for people who want to do it on the cheap or who just want to uh, get something going, uh, it's also more attractive of an option because uh, WordPress.com. Uh, has Shopify integration, and now you can actually get something similar for your self-hosted WordPress, uh, but you can run your Shopify store right out of your uh, WordPress.com account. Oh, I didn't know that. How long have they been doing that? That I don't know. <laughs> I just know right. that you can. But I do know that Shopify about two months ago released a uh, plugin for WordPress.org to do similar. Right. Um, so... John, what would you, like the things I asked Sally about um, shipping, sales tax, and um, the one that really, and it never really worked that well with Shopify, was um, the dreaded, you know, we halfway through the project, they say we need QuickBooks integration. That always um, was never mentioned at the beginning. But then I learned, I learned my mistake, and that I asked that from day one. Um, what's your insights about what I've just said, John. So as, as far as that, I, I couldn't tell you off the top of my head about QuickBooks integration, um, but I can tell you that as far as like shipping, um, you know, shipping methods, there's, you know, numerous extensions uh, for WooCommerce that will, you know, grab the UPS API uh, or the USPS and, and give you like a live... Um, you know, shipping rates. Um, so that's definitely like one way you can go. Um, I know that WooCommerce is making some 
changes to their you know shipping zones like right now um, and eventually like their current system for uh, like shipping tables is, is going to change uh, to make it like more user friendly um, so but yeah there's definitely like numerous extensions that you can use like whatever your shipping method is you can set it up to uh, you know, with, with the proper extensions, you can you know use like any you know provider that that you need to, and and you know set like flat rates, priority, whatever. Say like you know to cover your own costs for that. Um, so, yeah. and the other yeah. thing I like to point out, people, pre-planning is really important in, in any kind of web project. But when you start getting into e-commerce, unless it's a very, and I I keep hearing this, you know, and I use it myself. Um, uh, easy e-commerce but I've never come across one even when it's just a, um, anything more than a couple of products it always as it starts to build out it always starts to get a little bit more there's always something some customization or something um, would you agree with that Chris and that's why you really um, recommend uh, something like WooCommerce because you find that it, there's always some customization that comes up yeah, well, I mean, yeah, every every little business has their little quirk for how they want to do pricing and stuff. So, I mean, Shopify can't fit a lot of the baskets that a, a typical e-commerce company might have. Yeah, and, uh, and, you know, compared to some of the, I'm um, a bit, I know there's a couple other kind of, kind of open source um, PHP, what well, is a number of them, isn't there? But I'm, I'm trying to remember a couple that the most popular um, but I think of, of 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 that pack. I think WooCommerce is still the most flexible, most supported, and has the biggest documentation support community of them all. Would you agree with that, Chris? Yeah, I, I would say so. Yeah. Um, yeah. Another another thing I like to ask Sally about is a it's a other thing when I when I was dealing with this, Sally, more actively, was the question of photography and the, and the question of um, product photography. Um, I think, you know, um, you know, you can buy lighting boxes, you, there's ways of doing it yourself, but that you, you do need quality photography and that, you, even if you decide you're going to do it yourself or attempt to do it yourself, it's going to need some investment. How do you how do you deal with that issue, Sally? So far, I've the clients have generally arranged that uh, themselves because they and their products are in one place, and I am in another place, and and I'm not somebody who does uh, product photography. No. Um, so it's been more a, a matter of you know once we've decided what dimensions our, our images are, are going to be what you know what image ratio are, are we using square images or vertical images or horizontal images or combinations thereof so that the photographer knows to, to get things and you know should they be with a background or, or without a background um, and uh, you know that is a that is a big issue for uh, sites and it is something you certainly want to talk to a client about you know if they're Still in the planning stages of um, of this, the, you know, so that they understand this is a thing that they need to invest in. Yeah, I'm bringing it up because you know, if you find a local photographer that's got a studio and you're hiring them for a the day and you're taking all the products, and let's say I had I was doing one project um, was a high end chain of boutiques and they wanted and we were doing it in Shopify. And they just were shocked because um, they they got extensive photography from the wholesalers, but they had a lot of unique product from small suppliers, and they had to do the photography. And to get a local photographer that had product photography experience, um, taking all the products, it's a it was a one to two day affair, and it can easily get into the thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. And they were just shocked. Um, so what I was going to ask David, um, I'm going to ask you a, a slightly difficult question, but um, when it 
excluding the photography, copywriting, and all the other important external things, but the actual development, what do you can you give any insights and about cost? About let's say you, you're dealing with e-commerce, a WooCommerce solution, and you know, what what kind of budget should people be thinking about that? They're going to be quoted on. You got any insights about that, John, or is it just a too broad a, a question? Right, John or David? Yeah, Sorry, I was asking you. I was asking you, David. Oh, okay. You, I thought you. Okay, never mind. Um, I would say, first of all, whatever number it is that they have in their head, um, it's higher than that. But that's uh, <laughs> that's that's a small start. Um, I would imagine that they could say, think of what we would charge just for a general brochure site. And um, for us, I would say double that uh, because you're talking about a few more things that uh, need to be considered. Um, most people don't really think about checkout experience and the workflow around that. And, uh, you know, WordPress plugins have done a great job of making that easy, but they haven't made it, they have not taken away the idea that you're going to need to. Uh, design all those individual pages out. And I'm talking about, um, you know, receipts, account pages, checkout pages, um, the, uh, the cart, shopping cart page, um, groups of items, if you're not just viewing an individual item, you know, and so on, all those other different page views. Thing you see. And then whatever features that somebody wants to launch with, they are going to forget that they needed that QuickBooks integration until halfway through the project and uh, and go, great, we can do that, but it's going to add some more money. Now, for most of the clients that I assume that we're working with, saying, here, you have to buy this you know, $50, even $100 plugin isn't going to be a big deal because they're probably hopefully paying us quite a bit more to actually do all the other work. Um, but it, it, it can easily spiral out into people feeling like they're getting nickeled and dimed. Yeah, Ken, what about, got any insights, Chris, about this, about what your realistic budgets really based on your experience? So I can't really speak to how agencies uh, charge their customers for, like, the theme and the, and the website, like, building experience. I can only really speak to, like, the cost of, like, extensions and stuff that people buy, like, directly from us. But mm -hmm. I would probably add a, on top of David's comments, which is for each uh, extension, that you buy uh, and use on a site, I would also set aside on a per extension basis money to cover when those things break. Because, uh, you know, the second that your shipping plugin decides to break and you have to call David back and be like, hey, David, uh, you know, my, my pricing table for my camel isn't working anymore. I need to fix. Uh, you know, that's also getting more money. So. Uh, that's definitely one. Another thing is a lot of a lot of the companies that do e-commerce sites, uh, hopefully more and more, uh, also uh, encourage their clients to get retainer contracts for ongoing support issues. Uh, those range yeah. on an agency to agency basis. Yeah, that's great insights. Because I, I think what Chris is trying to point out, folks, is that there's going to be a substantial more ongoing support maintenance costs. Then um, uh, you know even at your average, um, what is called a brochure site or, or some other um, online functionality, because there's a lot going on. Um, John, do you got a lot of experience um, with WooCommerce and building them? What got any insights about what for a, a kind of small, medium-sized company? What are realistic budgets when it comes to? building something in WooCommerce based on your experience. Got any insights, John? Yeah, I, I'm with David and Chris is, uh, you know, whatever you budget for like a normal just, you know, straight up marketing site, an e-commerce site is going to have a lot more moving parts. And, and, and it's, you know, even for something like WooCommerce, which we perceive to be pretty simple, uh, Speak for yourself. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, I mean, that's what I'm saying. Is it, it, it's it's got to be like at least double like what what a normal site is, uh, because there are like more moving parts. You got to have like better hosting. You have to you know set up and configure all these extensions. You've got to do testing and and absolutely like having a retainer contract is a good idea, because I can tell you like all it, 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 it here's the thing. 
It's say you've got like different payment gateways. You've got like PayPal, you've got like your, you know, authorized or something like that. And it's heavily reliant on all these things working together in conjunction perfectly. Like WooCommerce itself, the extension, the payment gateway, all these things like have to work perfectly. And if one little step in that is not working correctly, then the you know the checkout isn't going to happen correctly. And these things get updated all the time. Payment gateways change, uh, you know, extensions change, like the base plugins change. Your hosting may change, or it may need to be upgraded uh, continually. There's a, like a lot of hosts that don't upgrade like their version of PHP on a consistent basis. So for all these reasons, it is good to have, um, you know, your agency on a retainer because. If you have an e-commerce site, it is is way more complicated than a simple brochure site, because again, any of these moving parts like get out of alignment, and things aren't going to be correct on your site. So, yeah, definitely, I would say like at least double. Um, in and again, if it's like a more complicated thing, if you have more like things and features that you're adding in there, or if you've got like a gazillion products that you want to add. Um, I would say even more than that. So, and you also have all these tangential costs uh, that aren't just the hosting or um, or the you know payment gateways or other things. Mm -hmm. So I have my brochure website that's like, hey, come visit us and buy stuff in our in-store person in 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 person store, um, and that's fine. And you know, the server goes down or the site gets hacked or something. And okay, that's that's bad, but it's not really bad. Uh, I didn't choose a backup service or a security service or something, fine. But now I'm doing that on my e-commerce site. I have no backups on that site, and that's everything. Like, that is a ledger of all of the actions undertaken on that site. And then for whatever reason, you lose all that data, and then you need to go, you know, get a receipt for a customer or somebody wants to make a refund or whatever it is that you no longer have that ledger available. Um, you have those tangential costs that you that are basically should be required for an e-commerce site. Extra security protection, uh, a real-time backup system. Um, I don't know, those are not off the top of my head. <laughs> those no. things that I, that I can do without on a brochure website, but are pretty much integral on this site. Yeah, it certainly is. Um, uh, Sally, I'd like to finish off um, with another really important area, um, which is, you know, Security and was it PS PSI um, um, PCI compliance compliance PCI, PCI. Um, yeah sorry um, can you give some um, insight about that particular subject and um, it's it, it's a can of worms but um, you really got you know I think that's one of the factors why people get attracted to fully hosted because they they say we will handle that can you give any insights when well, it. a lot of the PCI stuff is actually done by your um, merchant service, your your payment processor. But you, you do have to, if you're you know, if you're not sending people off, like you know, if you use regular PayPal, you send people over to PayPal. It's entirely PayPal's problem to maintain the the certificate. Although I I hear PayPal is going to start requiring SSL certificates, um, basically whether or not you're uh, people are going from your site to, to PayPal. Uh, and, um, you know, you yourself should not be storing anybody's card information. Just don't. It, it sets you up for unbelievable levels of, of liability. And, and so, you know, whether it's, you know, PayPal or Stripe or Authorize.net or whoever, they should be the ones who, who store that. But you are still going to need, you know, the SSL certificate uh, on your site in order to, uh, you know, for transactions. Um, and, uh, you know, you are uh, probably going to need a, a paid-for SSL certificate uh, versus, a, you know, a free Let's Encrypt SSL certificate. Uh, and, you know, there are some issues with getting those kinds of things set up and, and making sure you've dealt with any mixed content and, so on and and so forth. I mean, generally, you know, your host will set up the certificate for you, but there may be some some issues to um, 
uh, to balance back and forth and, and some things to, you know, make sure if, if you're using something like Cloudflare that your SSL is working with Cloudflare and then undo all of it because the QuickBooks integration doesn't work through Cloudflare. Um, and uh, uh, which I, I had to do on, on one site. Uh, so, you know, again, it's just extra levels of complexity that you you know you need to be aware of and you know a lot of clients if they're just starting out if they're if they're thinking oh why could you know sell some stuff online they may just not be prepared for any of that and and it is possible that by the time you explain what's involved and and the kinds of costs that are going to come in and and so on they're going to decide that it, it's not worth it to them because they just don't expect to make enough money yeah that's great. I think that's a great thing. Now, the other thing, um, John, um, I'm not sure I'm, I'm totally right about this, but even if you're, you know, the merchant providers that, isn't there still some um, legal um, responsibility of the actual um, owner of the business around their own computer security and the actual security of the part of the site that, um, is not taking credit cards. They, they still, you still have some legal requirements, don't you? Uh, to, to, to my knowledge, like PCI compliance is basically you're not storing like any sensitive data. You're not storing, um, you know, like credit card information. Anything that could be stolen, uh, like that. I would say that it's a good idea to make sure that your site's secure anyway. And to make sure that you're using like a SSL certificate on an e-commerce site, to make sure that that you know anything uh, that that could be accessed is going to be encrypted, I, I would say that that's just like a, a good idea. Um, but yeah, I mean that that's the whole reason why you're you would be using like a PayPal or like a third-party payment processor is because they're handling like that compliance and. And you are not storing like you know credit card information directly in your database. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's great. Uh, Chris, have you got any kind of um, insights about this or anything extra you want to add to it about the so security? It was, it was mentioned earlier that people would start requiring uh, SSLs. Uh, that was originally the case. They actually pushed it back to June and then decided later that they were going to uh, not require that after all. But I mean, I would still recommend an SSL certificate anyway. Uh, and particularly, if you're running on-site, you should have one anyway, but there's a new proposed uh, PCI DSS compliance uh, rule that they are looking at that would require, even if you use an off-site gateway like PayPal standard, to have an SSL certificate anyway. Yeah, I think that's good. Yeah, I, I, I see exactly where you're coming across, Chris, because they, they have gone down in price a lot, haven't they? And it just it just makes the whole thing a lot more secure in general, doesn't it? Much. Oops, he's, he's, he's on his bus, folks. Um, to finish off, Dave, what you got anything to add to it about secure, anything that people got to keep in mind or anything that we haven't covered to finish off, Dave, that you think people should be aware of? You do have a bit bigger responsibility um, for keeping things secure, not just you know credit card numbers and information which you might not even have on your site. Uh, but you do have a legal responsibility to your customers for all of their other personal information, like yeah. you know their addresses, for instance. Um, you can be held liable if uh, you know someone's physical location gets out due to a leak from your website. Uh, PCI, um, the uh, the actual PCI compliance uh, laws, statutes, whatever it is, there there's a list of um, of things that you need to do that need to be checked off to be PCI compliant and they can get really technical, really arcane for the average user really quickly, which is what makes, you know, just offloading it all to a third-party service very attractive. Yeah, the reason I bring this up, it was over three years ago. I had a client, and I won't go in, into it because they're still in business, and they they insisted they, for various reasons, it was the particular industry they were involved in, that they actually had to handle this themselves, and I just said it was just a, it was going to be a total nightmare, and it did turn out to be a total nightmare. <laughs> uh, um, so you really do have to understand that. So I think we've had a great conversation about this, folks, and we covered some things. 
that if you're looking at doing e-commerce, you've got to understand around budget, about shipping, about sales tax, and about the difference between having a fully hosted solution and some of the problems and around WordPress. So um, I'll start off with our panel. Sally, how can people get hold of you if they want to learn more about you and the services you can offer? Uh, sure, just go to wpfangirl.com and uh, you should find uh, all my contact information there. And I am at Sally Getch on Twitter and various other places. Um, to our great guest, Chris, who joined us, really thanks for doing that and for Dave for Twittering you. How can people get hold of you, Chris? Uh, probably on Twitter, at ChrisCT7. Oh, thanks so much, Chris, for joining us. It's been a pleasure speaking to you. Um, David, how can people get hold of you and learn more about the services and um, what you can offer, David? Um, Twitter would be best as well, at David Lieta. Uh, if you can go there and not be scared away, then I might be interested in working with you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why they would be scared of you, Dave. You're a very nice guy. Um, John, um, how um, how can people get hold of you and learn more about what you how you can help them? Sure. I just want to say, David, not scared at all. You're not a scared person. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, people who can get a hold of me, you can find me at my website, which is LockdownDesign.com, and you can follow me on Twitter, Lockdown underscore. Now tell the fine people how they can get a hold of you, Jonathan. Um, they can get me by going to the WP Tonic website. We've got loads of content, um, interviews from almost everybody in the WordPress community, um, over 50 uh, articles on all sorts of subjects, and... Um, they can either email me at jonathan at w-tonic.com or get me on Twitter, and that's at Jonathan Denwood. Or just do a search. I'm all over the internet. Maybe a bit too much, but who cares? So, my panel, I'm going to finish the recording. Come back um, um, and listen to the next um, show. Um, hopefully, we're going to be on Blab next week if it doesn't implode, because we like like chatting with people and it's great for that on Blab but I think we've uh, recovered from the situation and we had a great show and I'd like to thank my panel they've given some great value during this show so we'll see you next week, go to iTunes subscribe folks, that really helps and we'll see you next time <laughs>